Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. This is episode number 25 on the topic of heaven. And tonight we will complete, we will conclude the study on heaven. Uh, if you have not seen the previous 24 episodes, uh, you can find them on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, after tonight, uh, the whole series will be about a 50-hour project. So for about 50 hours, we've been talking about heaven, and I don't think I've ever talked about any theological subject that has made me so happy. So uh, before we get going, let's uh, have the panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with Brother Eric. Hi, everybody. Jesus Night 72. Um, looking forward to... Well, I'm not looking forward to finishing up this topic because it's such a wonderful topic. It's one of those topics you want to keep going with you know, for, for a long time because it fills you with a lot of joy. Um, and I hope I hope this whole series has been a great joy to the people who have been watching it. Amen. Thank you. And, and Brother Ronnie, Brother Ronnie, it's so happy. We're all so happy that you could make it to this time. Want to say hi to everybody? Hi, you guys. Uh, just got out of the hospital. I'm glad to uh, be here again. Uh, God bless you all, and I hope you're blessed by this session. I haven't been on for a long time, and I hope uh, I can be a blessing to you, too. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Uh, let me start off by just telling uh, the viewing audience that uh, uh, we're starting the show quite late today, and it's just simply because uh, we, we got absorbed in a, a kind of a private uh, fellowship uh, hangout that we we're enjoying so much and uh, was important. So uh, we'll, we're ready to start now. Thank you for being patient with us. And uh, we're, if, you, if you're not aware of this already, we've been using this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven as a guide. And uh, right now we're uh, on the chapter 39, and the question in this chapter is, will animals inhabit the new earth? So I read a little bit of his book and then we just uh, comment on it. And he says, people often ask me whether animals will be in heaven. Their second question, which is discussed in the next chapter, is whether they'll ever see their pets again. To some people, these are merely sentimental questions. To others, they are very important. Children especially want to know the answers. What do we tell them uh, when they ask? So before I go any further, let me just get your first reaction. Uh, what do you think about the fact that there, that there be animals on the new earth in eternity? Um, my, my immediate thought to that would be uh, yes, there will be uh, animals on, uh, into the millennium and into the, uh, into the eternity. Um, I think that animals um, are one of the uh, most amazing parts of God's creation, you know, all, all sorts of life that God has created uh, is some of the most amazing. And, um, you know, in, in this world that we live in now that's tainted by sin, we don't really get the full effect of being able to be around a lot of these different animals and a lot of these different things. And I think, I think that's going to be something that brings people a lot of joy. There's a lot of mystery to that. There's a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of excitement about discovery involved with that. So I, I think animals definitely will play a, a huge part. Okay, thank you, bro. brother Eric, uh, brother Ronnie. Uh, <laughs> I'm having I'm having a lot of trouble when I speak. Uh, <laughs> hold, hold on a second. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to switch things around here. Well, let me read a little um, further than that while we're waiting for that. Well, I got uh, two more ways than one, don't I? <laughs> Okay, right. yeah, I, I believe there would be animals on, on the earth. I believe there's animals in heaven. I mean, why not? I mean, God uh, created them too. But I believe that uh, since the sin nature be gone, uh, and the new heavens and the new earth, uh, I, I believe we're going to, you know, like it says, a lion will lay down with a lamb, is it the, the calf? So, uh, and a child will be able to touch a snake. Just think about that stuff. You can't do that now. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ronnie, the dog next door will bite you. <laughs> Ronnie, you 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 must have psychotic powers because you just <laughs> you just jump right to the next paragraph <laughs> in the book here. Uh, he he cites Isaiah chapter eleven. Uh, it says it speaks of a coming 
glorious era on earth where when the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So here we have uh, a clear-cut uh, declaration that there will be animals uh, uh, in eternity on the new earth. So we don't have to speculate on that. We know there, at least in these cases, and I'm sure there's many other animals that are not even listed there that we, we will uh, see on the new earth. I'm not sure whether we're going to have every every single species of animal or not. Uh, do you have any idea about that? I wonder about the oceans. There's not going to be any more oceans, right? So does that mean uh, no more sharks? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we talked about uh, that in a previous chapter where there, there, there's a verse that said oceans will be no more, but uh, I, if I remember correctly, it talks about great, there will be great seas. So a sea is another name for an ocean, and we were thinking that the ocean was something else in terms of an ocean of trouble. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think in our, our study on that, we, we concluded that, uh, or we were speculating that there will be oceans. But there will not be the fear of going, you know, when you go into an ocean, people have a lot of great fear about crossing an ocean, of the turbulence, the, 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 and uh, that's, the, that's what there will not be. But so I, I think there will be uh, uh, lakes, rivers, seas, oceans, and all kinds of animal life uh, within those waters. Well, one, one of the other things I wanted to point out, too, is the Isaiah reference that's used there. It is specifically speaking of the millennium, but we have no reason to, to believe why that wouldn't carry over into eternity. I mean, um, clearly, you know, when you say a little child will lead them, there will be children uh, being born in the millennium. They'll be growing up in a world that is ruled by Christ from Jerusalem, which is something they've, no one's ever known before. So you're going to have this, like, like it said, the earth is going to be full, with the, full of the knowledge of God. So um, they're going to be, but there's no reason, there's no place in Scripture it says in somewhere between the millennium and then into eternity, God's going to wipe out all the animals. I mean, why would he do that? It doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, the animals, unfortunately, because of man, have been cursed with sin and to live in a world of sin where they pursue each other. And um, wouldn't it be great to, to know that the animals will have their time in eternity in the millennium where they don't do that any longer, where they're free? Uh, they're free from this bondage of sin. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're eating yeah. each other, eh? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> you know that, uh, now, you know that uh, human beings, uh, that we're going to all get resurrected. Uh, and the, the saints, those of us who put our faith in Jesus, our Savior, we all be resurrected with glorified bodies to live on the new heavens and the new earth. And then the, the lost people who never put their faith in Jesus, they get resurrected to go to the great white throne judgment, found guilty, and go into the lake of fire. Uh, but what about the animals? There's nothing in the, in the scriptures that say animals will be resurrected. But the, there is a scripture that says uh, all the heavens and all the earth will be destroyed and have to be recreated. So I, I conclude that all the animal life on the earth will be destroyed and then God will just recreate animal life in, in the new earth. It, it's, they're not going to be resurrected beings like us. They'll be recreated, but there will not be a fall. There will not be the uh, conditions that exist in the, after the, with the curse. Uh, I think, you know, I think, you know, like our pets, you know, the animals like we loved in our lives that have died, you know, and passed away. I got a feeling that uh, God, because he loves us, he loves us just so much, you know. But that's just probably one more gift he may bring back to us. I'm not saying he will, but he may, you know. Like pets we love that have died, that we really yeah. love and put our love in them. Yeah, I think God might bring those back for us. Yeah. yeah well, that, we're going to go into greater detail discussing that in the next chapter. Oh, I didn't. Uh, but, but the next question he has in his book here is, do animals have souls? Mm. What's your first reaction to that? And do you have, does anything come to my, your mind? Yeah, the way my old dog used to look at me. I used to think he had a soul. I think he. I used to think he knew what I was thinking. You know. I don't know. Well, um, I, 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 
My answer to that question would be no. Um, one of the key things uh, and the reasons to believe that is because uh, animals were set aside, certain animals were set aside for the sacrifice uh, to be made as the symbol of what the Messiah's sacrifice eventually would be made. Uh, this was done um, to beings that were lesser beings than humans. They didn't have the value that humans had in that they had eternal uh, um, uh, souls that would go on one to hell, one to you know heaven, provided where they were going. But um, animals being put into that category, God never expected a sacrificing of human beings. It was something He forbid. He never wanted human beings to be sacrificed. He allowed animals to take that place and to symbol what the Messiah would give, um, God giving of Himself for us later. So this was all a symbol of that. So animals were created lower than us. Nothing is in. If animals had souls, they would have to accept Christ, you know, they would <laughs> or to save their souls. So um, animals don't have that capability. They don't have that, you know, that kind of understanding. I, so, no, I don't think they have souls in this sense. I think they have... Um, they have a spirit of life in them. Yes, they they have a spirit of they have a spirit of life in them. Yes. Um. So they have maybe that's like one aspect they're missing that we have that they don't have. You know, it's it's that it's that um that person of us that will go on. Let me ask you something, and I I you uh, based on what you've said so far, I'm, I think you may disagree with my opinion on this, but I, I've talked in in uh, one of my earlier studies on biblical Christianity, I talked about the the soul of, the, of man, uh, that we are a triune being uh, made in the image of God, we're body, soul, and spirit. Uh, and I defined what body, soul, and spirit are. Uh, I'm curious about how you would define man's soul. How would you define that? You know what? Go, go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, the way I was going to say it was actually I'm glad you said that because I think maybe there's a little confusion in what he's using as a as a terminology for soul. Maybe it, uh, he may disagree with it a little bit, and I think I know where you're going with that. Um, our spirit is what will continue to dwell, which is why we need the Holy Spirit to come into us and perfect our spirit. God perfects our spirit. That's what goes on should we die, goes on waiting for our body to be reunited with it um, in the rapture, uh, our resurrection, which is going to unite our perfected body with our perfected spirit. Christ has perfected the spirit, which is why the inward man... Uh, yearns to do the things that God wants him to do, and then the flesh part of us is still fallen, is always warring with the spirit. So the soul is actually, I think, maybe he's using the wrong word. He, he may, maybe he should be using the word spirit. Animals have souls in that. I think that's what Ron was kind of saying. Uh, animals have this life force, a personality, if you will, you yeah. know, that makes them unique. So they have a life force mm -hmm. that clearly means something, or else they wouldn't have been sacrifices to begin with. They're, they're lesser than humans, and yet they're more than simply, you know, like grass and trees and things like that. They're more than that. Um, so, but they don't have a a spirit that requires salvation. That needs to, you know, that needs the savior to save it. Ronnie, so maybe that's that? where maybe that's where you meant. Okay, Ronnie, do you want to elaborate on that? Do you agree with that? Uh, I kind of wonder about you know when man um, finally gets perfected, uh, because it, it says all creation looks forward to that time, and uh, I don't know. I, I know that all life comes from God, even a life that is is an animal's and fish and you know, grass and everything else. But I believe when animal spirits die, their spirits go go back to the Father, and I don't know what the God does with that, but. Um, I know that they have life, and they have a like you said, they have a life that, that thinks, you know, kind of thinks. Um, but no, I don't think. Well, I'll, I'll, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this because. Okay. Just... Okay. You froze. <laughs> no, oh, he's stuck. <laughs> he froze, right? Yeah, I think he's stuck. Conscious, the consciousness. Yeah. The, you stuck, okay. uh, Luke, Luke, you stuck for a second there. Could you kind of start over again? Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I've, this is a topic that could take a, a full study in itself, so I'm going to try to make it very concise. But I'll tell you what I think body, soul, and spirit is in man. Uh, it, scripture says that we're created uh, in the image of God, and God is tri, a triune Godhead, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think that man is created the same way, uh, three parts but one man. And you've got body, soul, and spirit, which is the triunity of man in the image of God. So the physical man is just the physical body, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's just a matter of, of a lot of atoms and cells making up this physical existence. And then the, the mind uh, is the soul of man. The mind is the consciousness, the, 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 uh, that's the identity of who we really are. And uh, then the, uh, the, the spirit is the connection to God. Our, the scripture says that man would, Adam and Eve would die on the day that they ate in the garden uh, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And they didn't die that day physically. They lived hundreds of years. So what died? I, I, I say their spirit died that day. Their spirit, I believe, is like an electrical cord collecting a, connecting my lamp into the, the wall, the, wow, the, yeah. the energy source. And the, the, this, the cord was pulled apart and disconnected from, the, from God. So man's spirit was disconnected from God at the fall. And we have a spirit, but it's not connected to God. We're separated. So uh, I think when we get born again, what happens is our spirit gets reconnected to God. We're regenerated, and now uh, we have a spiritual life. Yeah. Uh, and but our soul is something that is where whether we have you're lost or you're saved, you still have a soul that is uh, uh, our mind, our our consciousness, our emotions, our thought process. And that's all what I think our soul is. If if that is the case, if they were going to use soul in that, with that definition. It seems to me that uh, uh, animals would have a soul because they have a mind, even though it's not on the same level of, of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any disagreement with that that premise? No, I I, I agree with that. I think that, and, and that's I guess what I was kind of trying to say. Animals, I mean, animals in and of themselves have these personalities that make them unique. You know, um, one person's dog, you know, behaves. With a completely different personality than another person's dog, it's a the, there. There are things about them there that make them unique, um, just like you know our traits make us unique. Um, so they they don't they don't have a, something that requires salvation because you know they weren't part of the fall and they're not at that level that we are. But I, I guess that's what I was trying to basically explain there. But I think yeah, I agree. I agree with what you said. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, so Randy, uh, what does he say about the souls of animals? Uh, he he sa says, I, am I suggesting animals have souls? Certainly they do not have human souls. Animals are, are not created in God's image. They aren't equal to humans um, in any sense. Nonetheless, there is a strong biblical case for animals having non-human souls. Um, so he he thinks they do have a soul of some type, but, but that's different than ours. Um, now his next question is, why did God save animals from the flood? Um, well, to me that seemed like a no-brainer. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, well, he could have, he could have saved. Uh, I mean, when, what's your answer to that? I don't, I don't want to answer all the questions for initially. But I, I think he enjoyed what he created. You know, and he wanted to keep what he created. He, he loved the animals too. He created them. You know, and he also created them for our enjoyment. I think. Uh huh. Yeah, Adam gave them all. Uh, I mean, the world wouldn't be what it is, the creation, if the animals, if there was just man and no animals. I yeah, mean, but I think they all have a use too, you know, on your you know, exactly. So like yes, yeah. you know, the insects are almost like our garbage men. You know, they clean things up for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the oceans keep cleaning things, cleaning itself. So. Animals can either be our friends or enemies, and as our enemies, we see the sin nature even in the world. So we're reminded well, of that. That's a great. That's a great point. That's kind of where I was going to go. They have a, They have that natural source which links them to the rest of creation. You know, creation as it was made was made perfect in its way, and all those things were linked. God knew that we were going to have a use for animals as both the food source in the future, and if the animals didn't go on, how would there have been animals for the animal sacrifice? There would have never been animals for an animal sacrifice. So. Um, you had to have them for that as well. So they all have their their uses. Maybe maybe even more uses than we can understand. That we'll find out when when we go into eternity. I'm, I'm sure there are going to be mysteries, great mysteries in that that we'll discover as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm a mystery too. I mean, in heaven you had those cherubim, right? You got those three. The one looks like an ox, the face of the face of an ox, one with the face of a, a man, uh, and then the other one of an eagle. Yeah, what's the other one? Uh, face of a lion. So you got the beasts, you got the fowl, you got the uh, uh, 
let's say like the cattle, the, that kind of animal. Uh, you got the e eagle, which uh, of the birds. It's it's like there's a cherubim. I wouldn't know in charge of them. Maybe you know. I don't know. <laughs> and then where did the dinosaurs come in? The lizards, you know, and all well, you that. Know, that you know what? R R you know, Ron, I, I was waiting for Ron to stop because he, that's a real good point that he made, I think, because I, I would say, and I've done this before, but I'll do it again. I like to spin questions on their head. It's not, you know, will there be animals in heaven? The question is, of course there's going to be animals, but will we see a return of animals that were maybe once extinct? Will we see other types of animals, new animals that we've never known before? Will we yeah. see old animals that don't exist anymore? Will we see, you know, will we see all that as part of that new discovery and, yeah. the, and the new things in, in heaven? Yeah. We look, we look at those three that, that God talks about, you know, in, in Scripture, and then we remember Satan too was a cherubim. At one time, you know, yeah. what was he in charge of? The dinosaurs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the dragons, you know. You wonder. Well, um, you know, Randy asked a lot of questions in this book, and they're all interesting questions. But I have my own question now, and, and that is, um, out of how many species of animals exist, and, and and how many species have you actually observed yourself out of all species? Probably not, not very many, unless we go to the zoo, <laughs> you know. But I mean, what are the ones that are extinct? I think, a, I think a lot of confusion goes into the word species because people yeah. figure when you have an ant of all different types of ants that they're different species, but they're not. They're all animals of the same type. They're all animals of their kind. They're all ants. They're just different in some way. They've been they have mutations in some different ways, whether different colors, different sizes, different. But they're all ants. You know, all cats are cats. You know, uh, they look like cats. They they act like they look like different cats, but they're all this. They're all species of cat. So. Um, but but the but still even even that there's still so many species of animals now that we've never come in contact with you know I've been, there are lots of animals I've never come in contact with uh, you know it was going to be interesting to see one of the things that just blows my mind is when I get to watch the Discovery Channel and they're going deep into the oceans and I see ocean creatures that are so bizarre yeah. and they're thinking. <laughs> God, you made such an amazing creature there. I mean, I think of, you know, the common animals that we see in our life, and they're fascinating in themselves. Uh, and yet, when you look, go deep into the ocean, and you see some of these really bizarre creatures, I mean, God has such a great imagination, the types of creatures he's made. Yeah. Yeah, he's infinite. He's, he's got yeah. an infinite mind. Yeah. Uh, now, his, uh, his next question is, how will people and animals relate uh, in the Genesis account of creation, God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Genesis chapter 2. God then brought animals and birds to the man. Only afterward did God create the woman as a more suitable helper. So his point in it there is that uh, before even he, he gave Adam his wife, uh, he gave him animals. And he says he didn't, it's not good for man to be alone. So obviously all these animals were made, to, so man is not alone. He'd have all these fascinating, interesting creatures. Yeah, but he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't satisfied, right? And God wasn't satisfied for him until he, you know, laid him down, put him to sleep, and made Eve. Yeah, yeah, he said he, uh, only after did God create the woman as a more suitable helper. I mean, yeah. the animals were were good for for man, but but the, the, he needed something more suitable for him, and that is his uh, uh, another person, another human, uh, to be his wife. And then, of course, uh, you know, all oh, we wouldn't exist if he hadn't done that. So God, you know, knows the the end of the story, and uh, you know, it all happened just right. It's funny you ask that question because there's another side of that too. Is is um. The silence that we would know without animals in the world, I mean, it would be eerie. It would be kind of strange. I mean, when, you know, when, when you go out into the woods, one of the things I love is you go out by a lake or something, and you go out in the woods, you go camping or something like that, and you hear at night, you know, you hear the frogs and the crickets and the you know, cicadas, and you hear all these different animals, you know, birds and different things making noise. Imagine all that gone. There's none of that. I mean, it, it's a, it, it makes the earth a very dead, silent place, you know, with no yeah. life. You know, life brings, um, 
even the animal life, that life brings, I don't know, energy. It brings, um, it brings life to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Amen. Makes me glad I don't live in the Congo, though. <laughs> uh, then Randy goes on to say, we needn't speculate how God might populate a perfect earth. He populated Eden with animals under the rule of people. God doesn't make mistakes. There is every reason to believe he'll restore this self-proclaimed very good arrangement on the new earth. We should expect the new earth to be a place where we'll will fulfill our calling to be faithful rulers and stewards of animals. Yeah. God directed Adam to name the animals. The process of naming involved a personal relationship with the name bearer. Uh, Eden was perfect. Without animals, Eden wouldn't be Eden. If you look at our pets, too, I mean, uh, people have pets and you said they seem to have their own personalities. You know, you they're you, given up by God to take care of. You, know? you keep jumping ahead to the pets, and that's where I'm going right now on the next chapter. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> chapter 40. This is the fi finale here of the study on heaven is talking about these pets here. Mm -hmm. Chapter 40. Will animals, in, um, including our pets, live again? This is an interesting question because I said they are all destroyed, but will they be resurrected, or will he just create new animals? So uh, he says Christ proclaims that his throne on the new earth. Behold, I am making all things new. Revelation 21. It's not just people who will be renewed, but also the earth and all things in it. Do all things include animals? Yes. Horses, cats, dogs, deer, dolphins, and squirrels, as well as the inanimate uh, creation, will be beneficiary of Christ's death and resurrection. Christ's emphasis isn't on making new things, but on making old things new. It's not about inventing the unfamiliar, but about restoring and enhancing the familiar. Jesus seems to be saying, I'll take all I made the first time, including people and nature and animals and the earth itself, and bring it back as new, fresh, and indestructible. So it doesn't answer the question here, but uh, is he getting to that next about the resurrection? Uh, uh, So we know, I think we conclude here, yeah, uh, animals will be uh, in eternity with us, but now there's a lot of people who really have beloved pets. I mean, I know some people that love animals far more than they love people. And, uh, for, and, and sometimes it's with very good reason because, you know, your, your faithful pet is probably much more uh, wonderful in character and faithfulness than your your friends and family many times. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and some people would be heartbroken if they didn't have their pets in in eternity. Uh, what do you think your chances are before we go into Randy's answer on this? What do you think the chances are that uh, someone's beloved pet will be resurrected and they can enjoy that pet in eternity? I don't know, I think that's what heaven is going to be more like. Um, heaven wouldn't be heaven for some people if they didn't have their, their pets, kind of, you know. And God is so good. I mean, don't forget it was God out of his love who sent Jesus for us, right? Amen. So God wants heaven to be heaven for us. And I think if uh, somebody really beloved, had a beloved pet, I think God would have that pet uh, waiting for them. Yeah. Now, on the earth, I'm not sure, you know. Because God's going to make all new planets and everything. We may be like Star Trek and go off to these other planets and see all brand new animals out there, you know? Who yeah. knows? You know? We don't know. It's going to be wonderful, though, you know? It's, you're right. We, there's a lot we don't know about eternity and the universe, but that's the exciting thing. We have a lot of time and a lot of space to learn and explore. You know, you know, one of the things Ron said and what you said, it, it ties the whole thing together. You know, we talk about how much God loves us. We have to remember that God, God is a God of resurrection. He's, he's the God of restoration. He's the God of bringing back what was once dead. 
to be alive again. And that's not just in the living beings of themselves, but it's in our relationships and things like that. The only reason we lose our loved ones and lose our pets is because of sin. Sin, yeah. sep sin causes that separation. We die, these relationships go, and it breaks our heart when we lose our pets, and it breaks our heart when we leave, leave loved ones, and, it, and, and that all happens because of sin. It wasn't meant to be that way. So I would say yes, purely based on the fact that God would want to restore these ruined relationships by, that sin ruined, that he, he wants these relationships restored, these loving relationships we had. I don't see why not, you know? Yeah. God is so loving, and He's life. He's the author and finisher of life. Wow. <laughs> I just think about Jesus resurrecting. I mean, oh, I wish I would have been there to see that, you know. Yeah. Stepping forth from the, from the Well, tomb. you know, uh, that, uh, uh, Eric, I, I want to also reference what Ronnie said, because to me, this is, this is, uh, God is so loving. Mm -hmm. uh, he loves us so much, and if, if, if there is a person, for me, I've never been a great pet lover. I mean, we've had pets over the years, and my wife has always been much more attached to the pets than I have. I, I ended up getting more irritated with them than anything else. But it's you know I did grow fond of them, and I even wept over a lost cat one time, thinking you know I felt so bad that he might be gone and dead or something. But uh, I still I, I don't love pets the way some people I know do. I know that person. Uh, that pet is so important to them. If God loves that person so much, I think God's going to give the person the pet that they love. Yeah, I might have a few dogs slobbering me in a little while, you know, <laughs> when I go home. I'm looking forward to it, though. I'm not afraid of it. Now, his next question is, how closely are animals tied to our resurrection? Did Christ die for animals? Certainly not in the way he died for mankind. People are made in God's image. Animals aren't. People sinned. Animals didn't. Because animals didn't sin, they don't need a redeemer in the same way. But in another sense, Christ died for animals indirectly because his death for humanity purchased redemption for what was brought down by humanity's sin, including animals. Romans 8 is explicit on this point. Quote, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The whole creation has been groaning in, as in the pains of childbirth. We wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. On the new earth, after mankind's resurrection, animals who once suffered will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, Randy uh, is not quoting a verse to say that animals will be resurrected, or, but uh, he is he's stating it, so that's his speculation, and I think we're all in agreement on that. Mm -hmm. Makes me wonder, though, what kind of responsibilities we're going to have, you know, uh, being part of that new creation of uh, that, that, sons, that says the sons of God are being prepared for or something like that. Uh -huh. I wonder what we're going to be doing. Uh, respecting to the animals, or animals and creation, you know, the creation. Like our creation has fallen too because of sin. So, I mean, people who had like NDEs, I don't know if I believe in those, but uh, you know, heaven is perfect. You know, I mean, the beauty, the, the flowers, all that's supposed to be the trees, uh, trees of life, and all that. It's all supposed to be perfect. We look at even beauty here on the earth, and it, it's it's fallen. You know, so. One day it's all going to be like it's supposed to be. Yeah. Including animals. So. Amen. Uh, he, Randy says, if God created a new race of humans on the new earth, rather than raising the people who had lived on the old earth, would it fulfill the promise in Romans 8 of redemption, deliverance, and resurrection? No. Why? To have meaning, the people who are redeemed and resurrected into the new world must be the same people who suffered in the old. Otherwise, their longing for redemption would go unmet. As goes mankind, so go the animals. So, Randy's making the case that um, the only way that uh, we will truly be resurrected is if it's the same person. If it's not the same Luke, 
then, then I wasn't truly resurrected. It's a different cre a different uh, person, a different creation. He can't just create a new person all over and, and discard me. He's taking me and remaking me perfect. Uh, and, and now he's saying, if that's the case for mankind, then, then he said, maybe the same thing should apply to animals, and the exact same animal will be uh, provided for us through, through resurrection. So my little pet, Sammy the dog, that's buried in my backyard in Sicilia, yeah. the cat, will get the, that dog and that cat back. With us. I know my wife will be very happy about that. Uh, I won't be happy if they keep on, you know, being a nuisance to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes me wonder. It makes me wonder well, what you said made me wonder about something. Though. I was thinking, you know, it says, uh, God says, we are, we are in Christ now. Uh, we are also in the heavenlies. So I wonder, you know, if some, somehow part of us is there, you know, waiting for us in perfection, and we're going to be joined together with that peace, you know, of our spirit or something. It makes me wonder about that, that verse. You know, it, it talks like that, and it makes me wonder, like, do animals have that too? You know, I don't know. But I know that uh, Christ only died for man, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, did animals sin? I mean, they, you, to sin... Yeah. You have to uh, uh, know right and wrong. Uh, now, we before we sin, we still have the, the, the sin disease in our genes. Uh, it's a disease we're born with, the sin nature. So yeah. whether we commit a sin or don't commit a sin, we're st are still sin sinners by nature. Mm -hmm. But animals, they didn't uh, eat the fruit. Uh, a human, humans ate the fruit, and all of their descendants... Uh, inherited this sin nature, this sin disease, and so uh, animals suffered, just like all of creation suffered because of what man did. But I, in, in my mind, I don't see how animals have ever sinned. Well, I do. I remember this movie I saw in, uh, about these lions in Africa that ate all these people. Uh -huh. They didn't eat them at first. I mean, it took them a while to, to give up the courage to do it, but they were dragging them out of the tents and everything and, and killing them, you know? The uh, Lion of the Sorbo or Saigo or something like that. I can't remember the name of the movie, but it's a true story. They got the lions in the Chicago Museum of Natural History. Uh -huh. uh, but, yeah, I mean, God put the fear of man in animals, right, after after the flood. But some get by that fear, and I think that's the kind of sin. But they don't really, I don't know if they really sin sin. Uh -huh. But it seems like sin. They have them go after man after uh, God put the fear of man in them. Well, what's the worst thing animals do besides, you know, uh, poop and pee in my carpeting? Oh, worst thing is, pets. You're talking about pets, though, right? Yeah, yeah. But but just the worst thing animals do really is they're just predators. They eat other animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and yeah. and they that's uh, that's just to survive. That's just part of the, That's their food. The the uh, what do they call this? The uh, food cycle, or whatever it is, uh, the term for that. Yeah, but doesn't God put the fear of us in them? I mean, I mean, you look at any other animal, like besides like those lions or tigers and bears, uh, you know, they come after people. Uh, you know, they do have a fear of us. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think well, some just get over that, and that that's like going against God's will. Well, I, th I think what see the thing with the animals, and this this is this is where people have to understand what a great you know, event sin entering the creation was, you know, because when God created all of creation, the whole of creation was to be given dominion to man. You know, it was to be given, be given under man's control. And so when man sinned, everything under man's control fell under the, the curse of sin. So everything that we were to be involved with, animal life, plant life, the earth itself, the rest of creation, it all came under this, and it basically flawed and for a better, a lack of a better term, you know, it screwed up all the genetic makeup of all these different things because it allowed this imperfection to get into what was perfect. Because that's what sin did, you know, it, it allowed this this thing to happen. So while animals still felt that they understand that man has um, dominion over them, the beginning man was given dominion over the animals. It's funny because of sin being in them now is corrupting them and what they are, they lose that fear of man sometimes, and they wind up doing, we even hear in scripture that towards the end, more and more, we're going to see animals losing fear of man. They're going to start uh, turning against man. You're going to see more and more animals coming against man. So um, that that's all part of that whole fall. 
That's predicted by God. I can't remember where, but it's supposed to happen um, during the millennium too. Yeah, I can't. I can't remember the can't specific of the location either. of that. I can't think of the verse, but but I know it mentions where it's gonna. They're gonna be turning against man more and more. No, no, we, the, we look at fear. before the flood. Uh, I don't think the fear of animals was in uh, in the aspect, and I mean that's probably. I believe dinosaurs are running around back then. Uh, so yeah, pri- pri- they're flood. probably eating people, you know, and, and running. People were running. It was after the flood that God put the fear of animals in. But you know what? I, I think the dinosaurs um, were, yeah. were, were probably something very different before the fall. They, they, they weren't, well, they weren't, like, like all other animals we know, they weren't carnivorous. They didn't kill each other. They didn't do these. They were um, distorted and mutated by sin. They were, they were corrupted. And so they became something, they began to, there began to be predators among them that, that went after the other animals, you know, the other dinosaurs. So, and yeah, I happen to be of that belief too, Ron. I, I, think, I think the flood is what probably killed most of the dinosaurs. The flood killed most of them in the process of that. God knew man was going to go into these other areas of the world after this where these dinosaurs existed, and they, they also needed to be gone. Is us and this and these dinosaurs never could have coexisted with each other. It just never right. would have worked out. It would never would have worked out. You walk in your neighbor's house at night, you know, with a tyrannosaurus. <laughs> you, 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 could, you couldn't there. build houses anywhere. These things would be knocking your houses over constantly, eating people, <laughs> chasing us down. So you couldn't have this, you know. So and that and that was also part of the fall. So I think I think that's an interesting thing. I'm glad Ron said it because that's something I always thought is maybe we'll see a return of dinosaurs. In eternity, or and in the millennium, in the way they were originally supposed to be before the fall, you know these, yeah, these maybe great, these great grass, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's po- that's a possibility. Who knows? Uh, now, here's another question, uh, that, and, and that is that um, in the garden before the fall, um, uh, a serpent spoke to Eve, and Eve didn't say, "Well, oh, I can't believe it. A, s- a serpent is speaking. Animals can't talk." Uh, it it seems that uh, since Eve was not surprised that maybe uh, animals were able to communicate with humans uh, in, in a way uh, at that time, and uh, they were more intelligent and able to communicate, and maybe that ability will be restored, and we will have a closer relationship with animals because of that. Uh, in, the, in the New Earth and eternity, animals can well, – well, we know that uh, the donkey spoke when he condemned – yeah. Alarm or somebody. I mean, that was an angel speaking through him. I just opened up the animal's mouth to speak. Yes. Right? So that came up from an animal. But yeah, I remember we, we posed that question before, Luke, and I, I think that's a very a very big possibility. And I think at that yeah. time before the fall, it definitely would have made man's interaction with animals much more intimate. We would have been able to clearly uh, – they clearly would have been fellow friends and um, – and and companions and helpers, as the Bible said, they were coming to Adam as a helper. So it, he would have been able to possibly communicate with them. That might have been a possibility. Because I, I remember, I'm so glad you said that because I think I brought that up in the one conversation we had before. This wasn't something weird like Eve couldn't believe this was happening. This seemed to be a commonplace thing. It wasn't like she was taken back that this serpent, if, if it's what we take to be a serpent as we understand a serpent and it wasn't something else, yeah. it might have been something else. But it had legs. Yeah, I mean, it might have been something. It might have been something else. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. But it does leave you with the impression that it is a, a distinct possibility that man and animals had some sort of ability, whether it was just through their minds or whatever, to communicate with each other before yeah. that. I mean, well, there, be, there could be more cases that I'm not thinking of. But we got the serpent in the garden, and we got the donkey. Yeah. They, they actually spoke to to man and communicated. So. Uh, perhaps the in eternity uh, the animals will have that ability, a uh, heightened intelligence and, and uh, a uh, ability to communicate with us verbally or mentally or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be interesting. Do you want to know what C.S. Lewis uh, wrote about this? Uh, he says, um, in uh, many of his writings, C.S. Lewis commented uh, on the future of animals. He said, quote, it seems to me possible that certain animals may have an immortality not in themselves but in the immortality of their masters. Very few animals indeed in their wild state attain to a self or ego. But if any do, and if it is agreeable to the goodness of God that they should live again, their immortality would also be related to man. not. Uh, 
this time to individual masters, but to humanity. Uh, in The Great Divorce, Lewis portrayed Sarah Smith, a woman ordinary on earth, as great in heaven. On earth, she loved both people and animals. In heaven, she's surrounded by the very animals she cared for on the earth. Yeah, and it th makes me think, too, of those animals that save the lives of people. Dogs, oh, yeah. save, you know, like little kids. Wow. Dogs often great. save swimmers from, from sharks. Mm -hmm. I mean... It, yeah. it's, it makes you wonder, you know. Yeah. It's, 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 you, know you know, that's funny. Ron uh, said that. That was really good, Ron. Because I mean, I'm always. It, it's 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 almost like God. It, it, God is amazing. He he gives us sometimes these little glimpses. Yeah. Of, oh, we're of, in the channel, dude. Uh, of we're of in the he, yeah, he give, he gives us these little glimpses of what things should be like. Oh, yeah. And it's like, oh. and, when we, and when we see these interactions with animals and people, we look at it and we go, "Oh my gosh, that is amazing!" I mean, what? I can't believe that animals acting that way. I can't believe that animals doing that because, and you know, to me, that's like God's little ways. It's like His little ways of showing Himself. You know, yeah, yeah. And this is a little taste people of what things blind. should be. Yeah, yeah. This is, and and and, and because, you know, because of sin, we look at this and go, we have the opposite uh, reaction, which is, oh, that's really freaky. It's weird, but it's really not. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's not. It's yeah. not a bad. It's not a weird thing. It's the way it's supposed to be. You know. Well, yeah. Except for the shark trying to eat the guy. You know. I just watch this. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an example. I was watching this one on YouTube where this guy's. Uh, he's surfing in Australia over his wave, and you see this two big white sharks coming at him, right? Yeah. <laughs> they bite him. One got one bites him, and then this whole uh, I don't know what you call him, a uh, pod of uh, uh, dolphins come, and they whack the living daylights out of this shark. And the guy gets wave, you know. And it's like holy cow, that's God, you know. God be God. I mean, that, you just see that, you know. And and other people look at it, and, oh wow, you know, wow, that's strange. That's an oddity. Well, no, it's not, you know. It's like the simplicity of seeing God in the gospel. The gospel is so easy and so plain and so simple, and yet people make it so difficult and so complicated. And, you know, that's God exactly of love right. has that's come for us, you know. We could see that's it. That's exactly Holy, right. You know, the Holy Spirit's in us. We should be able to see God in everything we do. It's like right. Scripture says, you know, you see Jesus throughout the Bible. He's love. He's so much love. Oh, it's pathetic. Not pathetic, wonderful. <laughs> I'm okay, sorry. We're going to make the, the finale point here on this uh, topic with animals here. Uh, in this statement, of Randy says, uh, In a universe teeming with God's creativity, should talking animals or intelligent non-human beings such as angels and living creatures that not only talk but worship surprise us? If people will be smarter and more capable on the new earth, should it surprise us that animals might also be smarter and more capable? Remember, both in the fall uh, and the rise, the, that sin and resurrection, as goes as goes mankind, so goes creation. Uh, what stood out to me there is the worshiping. You know, we have the, the living creatures worshiping God. Uh, do you think that our pets? We'll be worshiping God with us, and the, all the animals, and the, the, all of mankind, and all the animals that we will all be worshiping God together. I don't know. Be it makes me wonder because I think some animals can see what we can't see. You know, like in the like in the spirit realm. I, I really wonder about that sometimes because uh, I've helped with uh, uh, deliverances every once in a while, and uh, the animals look and see things and bark and run away or, or run towards and try to bite things that we can't see. It's mm -hmm. really strange to me, but it, it's, it seems like there's, there's stuff around us going on all the time that we just can't see it happen. So yeah. worship? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Well, you know, what this, this question actually reminds me of if you w were to read or watch any of the movies of C.S. Lewis's works, and okay. even and even uh, even Tolkien, Tol J.R. Tolkien and and C.S. Oh, yeah. Lewis, both uh, are wrote with biblical uh, theology in mind, but then they have all these animals that are living and communicating and talking and had voices and uh, it that that may not just be some like uh, you know fictional uh, story for children to yeah. make, make it interesting to children. That may very well be a reality. 
Well, what's well, going to happen? We're all going to have a horse. We already have a horse. We just haven't met him yet. Right? <laughs> and that's we'll that's, that's, that's interesting. Very good. <laughs> I tell, right. I tell you something else. Something else came to my mind. You're right, Ryan. Something else came to my mind was the verse, where, um, you know, where where the uh, the children are crying out, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, and oh. uh, and and they tell the children to stop. And when Jesus, you know, they they, he, they tell Jesus, tell the children to stop saying this. They shouldn't say this. And he says, if if I stop them, the stones themselves would cry out. Right. So, it I I think in its own way. Upon its restoration, I think all of creation that's been groaning for restoration, all of creation will worship God in its own way. Um, the, I don't think we can the, help it. I, I, no, the, the, help the, the plants will, will, for God, be more beautiful than they've ever been. The, uh, the, the, the water will be more, more clean and more refreshing than it's ever been. The mountains will be more majestic than they've ever been. And these will be their way of worshiping God by... Uh, saying, you know, thank you for restoring. And, you know, God tells us in Scripture. We read it. it says that all of creation groans for yeah. for for restoration. And animals, also, absolutely. I can definitely see. I can definitely see animals bowing before the Lord. And uh, and and uh, yeah, absolutely. Can absolutely. you see? Absolutely. Can you see trees? Can you see trees bending over, bowing? To the <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet you I mean, like that. Uh, oh, possibly, possibly, just it, all things in in their own way, crying out to God, saying thank you. Yeah. Well, sometimes you know when the Holy Spirit comes on us, we do the same thing. You know, you fall on the floor. Oh yeah, we, we can't even. We don't yeah. even know how to. I can't, I can't recall how many times I didn't even have the words. I I, I didn't have the words to say. You know. You hear the beauty of the Lord coming out of somebody else's mouth, like earlier, and I start bawling. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Just, you know, the Holy Spirit comes on you. That love, that worship, and that, and that fellowship. You know, with, with absolutely. This, the Spirit of God is in us and with us. You know, it's such okay. a mystery too. You know. Uh, all right. That, that's a really exciting topic to think about animals and trees and everything. All of us worshiping as our great yeah. Savior Jesus together. All of creation worshiping is just. It's just right out of a like a movie of a C.S. Lewis movie that what you'd see. Yeah. Like, we see that as a real reality now. Yeah, or that, or that stupid uh, cartoon, The Lion King. You know, you see them all bowing down, but to, to a <laughs> yeah. little lion. Uh -huh. They're going to see the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Absolutely. Everybody's bowing down to the true lion. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yep. Yep. And he's going to knock the teeth out of that lion that's roaring down here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, until uh, all that's done. Uh, let me say, okay, we've. Uh, We've, I guess, been on about an hour here, and I think that concludes this, uh, the end of the book. What I want to do in the remaining time we have is try to take uh, uh, 49 hours of study and condense it into one hour here as kind of summarizing everything up, just touching on a lot of these points that we covered from the beginning, uh, as just as briefly as we can. So I'm just going to go through each of the chapter titles, and, and just we're going to just make a, a, a brief comment on each of these uh, and uh, that will kind of like sum the 50 hours up. Uh, uh, again, let me just emphasize, it's, it's a book by Randy Alcorn about, titled Heaven. I think it's been a great, a great book. Uh, it's very stimulating. Uh, the only thing I would caution anybody is uh, I think if you watch this series that we did here, uh, you're going to get salvation that's unadulterated pure grace. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> if, if you read Randy's book, though, I'm afraid you might get just a little bit confused. A few of the things he said in his book, talking about salvation and getting uh, a little bit confused about uh, uh, possible need for surrendering your life and picking up your cross and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, he has a little bit of that in there, so I'm disappointed that uh, he, he's a little bit confused on that. But as far as heaven goes, uh, he's uh, given us a lot of things to think about. Much of what he says is strongly backed up with scripture. Much of what he says is very speculative. And we, as a panel, have been speculating on all this now for about 49 hours. So let's kind of go back from the beginning and sum it all up. First of all, the first main point I want to ask you about is that uh, the typical uh, Christian uh, is it is it surprising to you that, that your average Christian, uh, not only your average Christian, but let's say I would say 90 to 99 percent of all Christians know so little about heaven 
uh, that we've discussed so thoroughly in this 50 hours uh, that so few people know so little about it, and there's so much to be learned about heaven. Yes, it's it's not only surprising, it's alarming, um, because it should be the central focus because it's what our future is all about. It's our destiny. Pre, pre-ordained, before the beginning, um, this is what God intended for us. And it is, yeah, it's, it's alarming to me that, that so few Christians uh, have the knowledge or seem in, as interested as they should be uh, about it. Yeah. Ronnie, from your experience, do you think, uh, uh, have you met very many Christians that have really studied heaven very thoroughly and really have a, much of a clue what, what to expect? No, but I, I, I really haven't. Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of NDE experiences, you know, like on YouTube and read books about it and things like that. We really should know as much as we should can about heaven because that's our real home. This isn't home. You know, this is a, a testing place, a, a place to get to know God, hear the gospel, and come out from among them. You know, it's this isn't home. I hate to say what I think this place is, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm looking forward to going home, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, and now the it's like one more thing about that, Luke, is something you said uh, along in the study, and people hear this if they watch the shows. Is and I just won't bring it up briefly again. Is you know you talked about counterfeits. Well, there's a surefire way to to know a counterfeit. You study the real thing, and if you know what the real thing is, you can't be fooled. So, like what Ron said about some of these people with their near death experiences, these NDEs, so called, it's hard to decipher what's truth and what's not. But if you learn about heaven and what God says about heaven in Scripture, you should be able to tell what the truth is and what a lie is. Yeah, because a lot of these NDEs, they come back with uh, what their um, church believes. Right. You know? they're, they're not, it's not biblical. It's something right. unbiblical, and that's what Luke had Right, right. It's their own doctrine. It's, it's, uh, that's when I know it's a lie. You know, I know it's right off a lie, you know? Yes. And that's well, terrible you know. because you have hope. You know, you start thinking about hope, and it's better to get into the Word because that's what the truth is. Yeah, man, we let's test everything by the scriptures. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 Uh, so, number one, we realize that very few Christians have really studied heaven and know very much about it, and that's very sad and unfortunate. I'm hoping that through this uh, study, 25 episodes, 50 hours on heaven, they're going to really understand it and get, get excited about heaven now. But uh, the the other part of the problem is not only are they ignorant about heaven, but what they do think about heaven is so seriously wrong mm -hmm. in that most people think that uh, uh, you don't even have a body. They think that you're some uh, existing in some non-physical realm as a spirit being, uh, and they don't even realize that it'll be a physical reality, a physical existence on a, uh, in a physical world on the new earth. Right. And you look, you look at Jesus when he comes during the thousand years, right? There's going to be the temple, and that's all a copy of heaven. And you can see where the river of life comes out the side, and it doesn't get more and more uh, deep as it goes along. It gets more and more shallow. And then uh, there's a, a, a trees of life. You know, it's beautiful. I mean, it's going to be a copy of heaven here when, you know, in a way when Jesus is here for that thousand years. And it's yeah. too bad, but he's going to have to carry that iron scepter. I was just reading about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no? Another thing that we discuss that is important to understand is that the, basically the, the three heavens throughout history. Uh, and, um, you've got um, the, the first one where the saved would go is a place called Paradise. We can learn about that in the story of Lazarus and Abraham's bosom. And, and you know that there's a great gulf between uh, 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 Paradise and Hades. And yeah. the people who, were, who would be saved because their faith in God would be uh, waiting for Jesus to die for their sins. That's paradise. Right. Now, when Jesus died and paid for their sins, he went down there and he took them up to, yes. to uh, heaven where the God's throne is. And that's right. where they are right now. So we have paradise, which was uh, in, uh, separate. In, uh, people were waiting for the, re the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then you have now a heaven where people are right now. And Randy Alcorn coined a term called intermediate heaven. Yeah, Randy, that makes me wonder. Yeah. How would you how would you define this term? Randy uses intermediate heaven. I don't know what Randy says, but what I think this is just my own heart and thinking. By listening to these NDEs, I think they go through real experiences, and I think that there is a spiritual realm out there 
where the enemy is is attacking people with trying to make things look beautiful, look right, look good, but just throws a just enough of a lie in there, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah, the, the most important thing that's lacking from all these near-death experiences is Jesus is somewhere missing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah. Yep. I mean, the most important thing... I mean, I should tell you right there, right? If, if you have a near-death experience and you go to heaven, the first thing you should be talking about when you come back is, Jesus, he yeah. says, he says, yeah, yep, he says yep. we, we just need to pull our faith completely in him. That's the good yeah. news, everybody. Jesus told me that. That's what Every few do. times, so you find one that does that, and that makes you wonder, you know, yeah. like, like uh, God is, but, or, or you have these people that have these experiences that say, well, Jesus came and visited them in their room, okay? okay. That, that, that's supposed to give them some kind of authority authority in, in, in their uh, ministry. And the thing is, uh, Jesus says, you know, if you don't look for me in a desert or in the back room or here or there, it's, it says in Scripture, Scripture says, He's going to come like lightning from the east yeah, to the yeah. west. And you're, every going to know, you're going to know when I'm coming. You're, there's not going to be yeah. any question. You're going to know. <laughs> you know like, there's, there's some famous authors and stuff out there that are saying, Jesus walked in the room. I think that's that that's a fallacy. I think that's the spirit realm messing yeah. around. Yeah. So let me ask. Oh, and, oh, as far as the, your question, the intermediate heaven, um, the best way to explain Our it man, that is it's – um. Intermediate heaven is heaven as it exists now prior to its un its union with the earth in eternity. So it is sort of that place where we go awaiting that time where heaven is going to be united with earth after the millennium in the eternity, and the two are going to become one place. Um, it is a place with possible physicalities, something like we know here, that there may be some physical nature to it, but we know the people there are who have gone before us are going there to await their raptured bodies, their perfected bodies, waiting to be joined to their bodies as we're waiting to be joined to ours, um, to to partake of these physical things. Eventually, earth and uh, and heaven and earth and the creation and heaven becoming one one living place together. So that's it's sort of sort of heaven in the holding pattern, waiting to join in eternity with the creation. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> I can't wait for that. The reason we use the term intermediate is it because it, it is it is the heaven that exists between paradise and the new earth. Right. Okay. Uh, you had the Old Testament saints waiting in paradise for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That happened. Now he's taken all those people up, and all of, all of our uh, the beloved saints who have died since the cross. They've all gone up, and they're in heaven right now, but Randy calls it intermediate heaven because it's not the final heaven. It's the people who are living and waiting for the bodily resurrection and the new creation, the new earth, to live on in eternity. So you've got paradise, you've got the intermediate heaven, and then you've got the eternal heaven, uh, the new heaven, new earth, where we'll be living throughout eternity. Uh, so very few people really understand the this. Uh, this uh, I, I don't know if I agree with that though. You know, like an intermediate heaven where where souls are waiting to go to the real heaven. Is that what you're saying? No, what they they are is they're they're in heaven. That's where the throne of God is right now. That's where oh, Jesus yeah. is sitting. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Right. And, and all of the saints are w up there with them now. Okay. And, okay. He, it says that Jesus is uh, uh, standing and sitting, that it's a physical reality, and we don't believe that Jesus lost his resurrected body. As it's just no, spirit. no. He's like so, that forever. So it's a physical reality. Jesus is not the only physical being there. We believe that, that uh, there's other physical uh, existence in this other realm, but it's not a completely spiritual dimension where it's just oh. nothing but souls. Uh, okay, that almost sounded to me uh, like, like a Catholic thing, you know? No, it's not like a purgatory type of no, thing. No, no, no. <laughs> no, um, it's heaven. It's heaven where people are right now. But the problem is that heaven is not going to be uh, separated from the earth indefinitely. Someday that heaven's going to come down and join the earth. Right, right, right. right. Well, then, well uh, speaks of that after 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 the thousand year reign of Christ. It says exactly, that, exactly. That heaven's going to come down. But it says it's like a cube, like right. Yeah, pretty big. Yeah. Thousand one hundred miles by thousand one hundred miles. A thousand one hundred miles. That's a big heaven, man. <laughs> you know what that means, too. Our God is big. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got we're at the point now where we see that uh, most people haven't studied heaven and they're very ignorant about it. They think that people who are in heaven right now are don't have a physical reality. They're just spirits 
uh, you know, playing harps or something, and, and uh, it's very boring. Most people oh, think okay. going to heaven would be boring instead of wonderful and thrilling. That's oh, a very, very unfortunate. So I hope that if you've watched this series, you're getting excited, even about the intermediate heaven, that it's not a boring place, it's full of the glory of God, and it's going to be exhilarating to be there. The next thing is uh, there comes a point where uh, um, we believe that there's going to be a series of events in history where Jesus uh, calls up the saints, the, the, those who believe in him, and, and we are taken up off the earth like beamed up in Star Trek. We're going to all get beamed right. up. It's like it's called the rapture. That's what we refer to it. We're going to get raptured, and even you know, the people who have died and are already in heaven, their old dead bodies will get resurrected, and we'll all have resurrected bodies, glorified bodies, that go up to heaven. Uh, and then what's going to happen is there's going to be uh, a tribulation period on the earth. I, I think, do you hold to that too, Ronnie, that there's a rapture and a tribulation? No, I also hold the bridal. Uh, yeah, because not everybody agrees in the in the in this series of the events here. But I think if the three of us agree, there's going to be the rapture. We're going to be resurrected, mm -hmm. and then there's going to be seven year period where the world right. goes through this terrible time where the antichrist right. takes over, and then after that, some of the people will be saved during that time, and some won't. But but Jesus will come back then and defeat the antichrist, and and then he's going to destroy the earth and uh, destroy uh, all life on the earth and all mankind uh, except for those who are saved then there's going to be a judgment the judgment seat of Christ is for the people who, who are saved and we're going to be judged on our ministries all the wonderful things that Ronnie and Eric did since they got saved that Jesus says well done well done well done you're going to get gold oh, I hope so I hope I did something gems and crowns and treasures in heaven because of all the good well done things you did uh, and then the people who never put their faith in Jesus but rejected the free gift of salvation they go to this other judgment called the great white throne judgment where they're going to be find, found lacking of uh, eternal life. They never received eternal life, they never put their faith in Jesus and they get cast into the lake of fire, hell. Uh, then what happens Eric? After they, they're cast into hell and uh, we've had our rewards we have the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment, the great white throne judgment. What happens right. next? So that that's that is the, at the end of Christ's uh, thousand year millennial reign, and at right. that time, uh, sin is going to be utterly destroyed. There won't be sin any longer. And once that happens in creation, then heaven that has been waiting for its its uh, for the creation's restoration is going to become one place with the creation, and eternity is going to be heaven and creation existing as one one place. Uh, for eternity. I'm glad no more death, no more death. suffering either. I don't know how I forgot in my little account there to leave out the millennial the reign. And the millennial reign of Christ. Brother Ronnie, why don't you talk a little bit about that? You've got the uh, we've got the resurrection, we've got the tribulation, we've got the defeat of the Antichrist, and then Jesus setting up his millennial kingdom. Tell, talk a little bit about that before, because I... Well, I I'm, not really, I'm not really up on too much on, on the, uh, what's going to happen during the millennium. Um, I do know that Christ is going to reign, and there's still going to be a sin nature, you know, even though the Lord's going to restore everything. After, I mean, the earth is going to be destroyed just about during the tribulation. The Antichrist is just going to wipe things out, wipe people out. <laughs> take as many people to hell or, or wherever with him that he possibly can. And uh, there's a lot of speculation on what's going to happen during that time, whether uh, people's DNA are going to get changed or, or whatever to make them not human anymore so they can't be resurrected. And maybe that's why God uh, says once you take the mark of the beast, you'll, you'll never uh, be saved. You know, God can't forgive you because you're not human anymore. Now that's a possibility. Uh, but after that time, after the devil is chained and thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is going to reign on the earth from uh, Jerusalem. But what, what was, used to be strange to me is that he always carried a, a, an iron scepter. And it's like as loving as he is and wonderful as he is, uh, there's still going to be a sin nature and, and the Lord's going to have to put, put a, you know, use an iron scepter on people or on nations. You know? uh, but 
that reject him. And then at the end of that time, it says the whole world, when Satan's let out, it says the whole world's going to come against him. You know, like uh, Satan's going to fool the nations again. And after that wonderful time of Christ, it's like they didn't learn anything. Just like today, you know, when we have the, the free will to say yes to Jesus, it's like they're going to see him face to face. There's going to be no faith involved, but just believing and, and following what he says, and they won't do it. And yeah. there's going to be one more big war, and God God isn't going to take it anymore. It says they're going to encamp around about the city, and God's going to wipe them out, you know, in one big swoop. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's going to be, like you said, some are going to survive through. And uh, uh, so some people, save too. pardon me? I, I, I think everything you said, we all, we're in agreement. Uh, you've got some people get saved, uh, got saved before the cross by putting their faith in the, the yeah. blood sacrifice that would be provided later. The, right. Some of us get saved uh, after the, the cross because we look back and say Jesus succeeded. And he is right. finished, we're trusting in what he did. And, and now, and then some people are going to get saved during the tribulation period, and yeah. then some people will get saved in the millennial period. So there'll always be a, some people that get saved and some people that don't. And there's all these periods. After the thousand year reign, after uh, the, the devil is released and there's a rebellion and Jesus defeats them, then comes the grand finale where Jesus right. is destroying the earth and all, the, all of the universe will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then he recreates a new heaven and a new earth, a whole new universe, and that's perfect without the the the, the fall, the curse. Mm -hmm. That's when that's when this intermediate heaven that, that are all the, the, the saints are in right now will come down. It's called the New Jerusalem. It will come down onto the new earth and, and be joined together. So God will dwell with man on earth just like He did in the garden, and that'll all be restored. And once we get to that point, now that's where we're at in, in the timeline. Right. Well, that's where we go into eternity. Mm -hmm. But what I like is uh, I think during that time of the destruction, we're going to have to all be in that city to be protected. You know, all, all the saints, they're going to have to be in that big square city of heaven to be protected as the heavens are being destroyed and the earth and everything. And I wonder where hell is going to go. Or, you know, the... The lake of fire and all that? What's going to happen to that? The is it left says, in the darkness, strolled up somewhere? The scripture says that death, hell, and the grave are cast into the lake of fire. Right. I believe it's going I'm to be... I'm starting to believe dead. that it's going to be instantaneous, too. I'm starting to wonder about that, you know? Because then it'll be... He, the Lord calls it the second death. And when you die, you're dead, you know? Uh, your body's dead. You don't think. Your spirit goes to heaven. But yeah. the second death, it's, it's like uh, God is merciful. Ooh. Well, whether whether I mean, they're again, Jesus was so great and so wonderful. I mean, people deserve to suffer forever. So I, I'm not really sure. But. Well, you know, we don't all agree on this. Uh, I, I, I think it makes me wonder. Them. I, I think that uh, when the scripture says that death, hell, and the grave are cast into the lake of fire, uh, and then and then there's everything's destroyed. There's I think that that's destroyed too, and there's no more hell either. But whether I'm right. Or Eric is right that there, there will be a hell for eternity and eternal torment. We yeah. know that that doesn't apply to us who put our faith in Jesus. Right. We're going to have joy and bliss and ecstasy on the new earth with our Savior Jesus and all the saints and our pets and animals and so on. So that's what we have to look forward to. But so now we're at the point in this timeline where uh, you have the new Jerusalem, the, the heaven, come down on the earth. And as you said, it's a cube, or, or at least the dimensions uh, seem to be cube. It's 144,000 like cubits or miles or something squared. Yeah, right. we talked about that. It could it could be a cube, or it could be a pyramid. 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 It, pyramid it, yeah. it, it, it could be the one. When, when, and, and when it calls it, it calls the city God's holy mountain. Uh, it could give you the idea that it may be mountainous shaped. It may be uh, pyramidic shaped. Yeah. Um, so we're in the physical realm trying to explain spiritual things. You know, we're, yeah. we're so childish in that. It's, it's, uh, we just don't know. But yeah, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> right. We have that hope. You know, I think about us right now. I'm 57. I'm an old geezer, man. I, I look at you two. I'm listening to you, but we all sound like kids in a way. You know, we get that happy. We get that joy in us. Uh, like we talk like little children. When we talk about heaven. Or, oh, or absolutely. Jesus, or about the Father. You know. Oh, that's that's. Cool. I think I'm looking forward to looking at sitting on his lap <laughs> if I can, you know. 
Yeah. Well, that gets us to this point, the next point, where it's okay, now we are existing in eternity on the new earth, Okay. And, and God brought his heaven down and put it on the earth, and so now you have heaven and earth joined together. We have Jesus Christ um, a, a, a living with man, and now we get to see God face to face. When we first see God face to face, and we are in the presence of the actual glory of God, um, what is that going to be like? Oh. I mean... The, We've talked about this in previous shows, but Ronnie, you weren't there, so I mean, I, what is your what is your reaction when you first see Jesus face to face, and you are experiencing the real glory of Jesus? I don't know, I'm a man, but I'm gonna be at his feet crying, bawling like a baby, thanking him. I'll be getting his feet wet, you know. I can't dry it with my hair anymore because I cut it all off. That's. But, uh, I think that's what I do, you know. I'd be so thankful, and, and because of the God's grace and. What Jesus has done for me, and well, for all mankind, but that me too, that I was included, that He saw me as as somebody worth saving. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just so thankful and grateful for that. Because believe me, I was a sinner. You ask anybody I know, that's yeah. pretty bad. We won't get into that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's what I'll be doing. And then I'll be hugging him if I can. And if He allows me to go to the Father, if I get through that, that that. Uh, <laughs> Gee, I'm going to go over and run up to him, fall on my face, ball before the Father, and I'll try and crawl up on his knee and sit there and just hold him and let him hold me, you know. Because I know my, my name is, is, is written in his hand, yeah. so I have a place there. So uh, now we are, we meet with Jesus face to face, and now we have, from that point on, we have eternity to yeah. enjoy God and yeah. to enjoy our, uh, our fellow saints, uh, humanity, that's, that has no sin nature, and our animals, and the new creation, and yeah. and then, of course, what are we going to be doing? What are, what are we be doing through all? Well, God all says we're going to be kings and priests. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine anything like that? You know? Yeah. Oh man, I don't know. You know? <laughs> you think of Star Trek, right? but then you know, maybe God will say, "Okay, go out to this planet, Ronnie. You're going to have to run this area." I'm going to say, God, I don't want to leave you right now. You know, I'm, I'll be like a baby running away from his mother for the first time. I won't want to leave the Lord. I don't know. It's going to be wonderful, though. You know. So we know that we know that in eternity, uh, God, <coughs> God gives us some kind of inheritance. Yeah. Okay? Inheritance is is partly based upon just being joint heirs with Christ, but it's also based upon uh, personal merit. Based upon uh, our ministries, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be judged uh, how many well done, good and faithful servant things we've done, and uh, and we're going to be assigned certain jobs or, or offices. Uh, some people will have rule over a city, others five cities, other ten cities, and who knows? Maybe it'll even not only be cities, but it'll be planets. Uh, it's going to be a large universe, so who knows how large this uh, this kingdom will be that we are going to be hoping to Jesus to to rule and reign over with him. But we'll all have jobs and all have authority and all have responsibilities. How does that look to you, Brother Eric? I mean, is that is that exciting to you, or does it seem like well, that's a lot of work? Well, I mean, I mean, it's definitely humbling um, to think that God loves us that much yeah. uh, to reward us with that kind of an undeserving type of reward. Um, it staggers my mind every time I think about it. I mean, it just it it uh, it, it overwhelms me with with the, the the giving nature of God and the way He's so ready to pour out loving gifts on His children. Um, you know, it, it's um, and and because of us being in our human fallibility and how we are right now, it's kind of hard to conceive. But it's also going to be done in such a way where um, we'll love it. You know, anything God's going to reward us with, responsibility-wise, is something we're going to love. It's it's going to be something we're going to be excited about. It's like it's like the job you've always wanted. The job you get you get up in the, when the alarm clock starts in the morning. You get up in the morning and you're singing because you're so happy you're going to work. You know, it's that kind. Of, it's it's that kind of job, guys. So that that's something to be that alone, is something to be excited for. You know, it it's um, it's uh, like I said, it's uh, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It's um, and and I don't really think it's something that we can truly appreciate. Something something Ron said. It's funny, you know. It's it's um, 
you know, God, God may say, I need you to go to this planet, this solar system, this place in the, in the universe and, and do this. And of course, Ron's first reaction was, oh, well, Father, I don't want to leave you. I've done, I've yeah. been on it. And, and the great thing, you know, the great thing is, is your father will tell you, Ron, you, I'm not leaving you, and you're not leaving me. I, you always have access to me. I'm right here anytime you need me. I there there is we th there is no you leaving me. There is no leaving me anymore. And t you know, no matter how far we are, he's right there. Uh, and that to me it is a comfort, a great comfort, more comfort than I could ever possibly think of. And I think we <clears throat> keep. Let's keep one thing in mind throughout. Uh, this all of eternity, uh, we're going to have work and we're going to have uh, play and we're going to have a lot of things to do and we're going to have some responsibilities, uh, but uh, it's going to be in this context. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. Okay. So, in other words, if God told me to, uh, he had a, a job for me to do that I didn't want to do, I mean, I would be crying over it. I mean, obviously, he's only going to have me do things that, that I, I'm going to get excited and thrilled. Yeah, what a man I am, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I think so, about God, I get to be like a little baby, you know, like a little child. Yeah. Everything is going to be positive. There will be no reason to ever see get get uh, sad or depressed. Or no more sickness. Yeah. We'll never get sick. We'll never die. We'll never have any of the things that are in our old sinful nature, jealousy, anger, you know, envy, all those things will be gone, uh, back, backstabbing, all those things that we've dealt with on this earth. No more of that, only just wonderful fellowship with our Savior and with our fellow saints. Amen. 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 That, that gets us to uh, relationships. Now, we're going we're gonna to be spending eternity. It's, uh, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't think we can even imagine that. You know, we're we're used to time, with birth, death, you know, and all that. That, that time period, uh, yeah. all goes around the earth and all that. But eternity is like Jesus and God lived in eternity forever and ever and ever before he even came here. Yeah, I can't imagine that. But we're, we're going to be there, you know. Now I am really looking forward to spending uh, part of my eternity with you two. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm really, really looking forward to that. And there's, I, there's some other really beloved saints that I really. Yeah, I'm gonna bear hug a few people, man. <laughs> Absolutely. But eternity is a long time, and how many saints will there be? I don't know. Are there, is there going to be a million, or ten million, or a hundred million, or a billion? I don't know. But how many uh, angels are there? Whatever, whatever number of saints <laughs> there are, uh, there's a lot of people to get to know and have fellowship with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but we'll have time. We'll ne yeah, we'll never be short of time to spend with everybody and to get to no, know everybody. And like I said in a previous episode, you know, the whole relationship thing is going to revolve around the fact that we'll finally have relationships with each other the way they were meant to be. You know, on Earth, all our relationships are always tainted by sin. We, we can't we can't fully trust anyone we can't because because I you know I would never tell anybody hey you can fully trust me 100 percent because I'm gonna let you down I'm gonna do something wrong I'm I'm a sinning person I'm gonna make I'm gonna do things wrong but in heaven and eternity it's much different it's the ultimate relationship the ultimate friendship the ultimate sharing with your brothers and sisters in a way that you know everybody's genuine everybody loves each other everybody's feeling the same things you know and yeah. everybody's thriving on it and excited about it that's an it's an exciting time it, it, oh, it's yeah. just an exciting time well, we won't be sleeping anymore either I mean sleeping's out oh sleeping who, who wants to sleep I want to see yeah, everyone you know we won't, <laughs> right. we won't get tired you know, exactly. Uh, exactly. Nobody will want to sleep God anyway. Just, you know, it makes me wonder though. It's like God says we're going to be kings and priests, right? Mm -hmm. Now a priest faces God for something behind him, mm -hmm. you know, like the high priest did. You know, he faced God in, in, the, in the temple for the people. What are we going to be priests for? I, I'm not sure. Oh, I, I mean, we just don't know. I have to study that the verse in context. Uh, I think I know that we are priests right now. Uh, okay. Currently, you are a priest, and I'm a priest. Eric's a priest. We have this priestly uh, uh, where we are uh, ministers uh, okay. to tell people about Jesus. Uh, that's a priesthood we have right now. Uh, see, see, Jesus when when he came 
uh, he was uh, a, pro a prophet to, 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 and, and savior. Uh, and then right now, right now he's a high priest. He, we are priests, and he's the high priest. Oh uh, and then when he comes back, he'll set up his kingdom, and he'll be king. Uh, so these are the different roles that Jesus will, will plays. And but our role right now is priest. Uh, uh, I don't know in eternity uh, in the new earth if there be any reason for being priest because uh, I mean there's there's no reason for like uh, any things that are priestly duties that I can think of right now. I, th I think um I think again we got to go back into that gap that we we kind of want to skip over sometimes which is the millennium. Uh, we yeah, keep forgetting yeah, yeah. about that. We we keep forgetting about that thousand year reign and in the thousand year reign, Very good. Pe people are still going to have choices. And I I think that context really pertains mostly to the millennium. We'll go out with authority and once again continuing what we did on this earth, except more effectively sharing the good news of God to the nations in the millennium. Going out there, being priests of the word of God, priests Wonderful. in uh, priests in our experiences. You know the you know we we have I know it sounds crazy to some people but we have an advantage over beings like angels in the fact that they've never lived the lives that we've lived. We have a very unique a very unique perspective on sin, having it been in our lives at one point in time, and then knowing the value of it no longer being there. There's going to be something special about that and sharing that with other people in the millennium. And I think that's something unique to only the saints that only the saints can really understand. We can't other people won't be able to understand that. Right. Well, I think that one big thing is we can come to God by faith. They can't. They see Him face to face. Exactly. That's right. They will. They'll have Christ right in front of them. We we come from that age where Christ says, "How blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe." You know. So, you know, there's a special blessing there for those who have never seen firsthand all these things happening, and yet we put our faith in Jesus, and that's going to be a very unique. Um, uh, perspective that we're going to be able to bring to the millennium, I think, when the, when the nations are rebuilding and people are learning and making choices. We just talked about that. They're going to be making choices in that process up to the point where Satan is loosed again. So I think that's really yeah. kind of what we're talking about there. Okay, that, that's wonderful. And I think Brother Luke forgot when I was talking about horses that we're going to be coming back with, with Jesus, you know, the saints. Mm -hmm. And so like one, that's that's why I, say, I, I totally agree with you now. I think that's where it's going to come in, where we're priests, because we're going to be talking to people, uh, still ministering to people. But so much now, while we're still here in this time before the Lord comes back, you know, I so appreciate you guys who go out and you, you minister to Jesus to so many people. That is so important right now, you know. Oh, somebody else is coming in. Hi. Hey, Brother Jason. Welcome. Okay. Praise hey. the Lord. Praise Hi, the Jason. Lord. <laughs> Uh, you know Eric, but I don't know if you've met Brother Ronnie. Hello. Well, we're still alive. Yeah, we're still alive, man. You know, we're going to go on for a while. I can't we'll hear you. Who, who's uh, uh, running this? Jason? I've never met you before. How are you doing? Praise the Lord. Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Well, we're finishing okay. up. The I'm Ronnie from uh, Milwaukee, or Hood Minister from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hmm? You know I love Luke? Milwaukee. I, I met Bo Ryan about. Oh, okay. Fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. love the man. Okay. All right. Right now we're, we're talking about with Canton Badgers basketball team. All right, we'll go. Uh, we'll we'll get on to all those other topics. Uh, Brother Luke, you want to keep going with this heaven thing so Jason can get in on this? Yeah, Jason can. Uh, he can this either. This is Brother Luke's show. We finish up heaven, or uh, sometimes he waits till the show's over to join. So I'll leave that. Good to there. see you though, Jason. Uh, we're so we we're on the new earth. The New Jerusalem, the capital city of the New Earth, where the throne of God is, and what people I want. I can't to... hear you at all, Brother Luke. You can't hear me. Yeah, I, I can hear you, but I guess Ron can't. Ron, I don't know what happened there. Can you, Ronnie? Can you hear me now? Nod your head if you can hear me. Oh. Uh, He's having speaker issues. Still looks like. <laughs> yeah, that was. I don't know what happened there. Ronnie, did you did you press a button? Oh, no, I can't hear me. All right. Well, hopefully he'll get that fixed. But the point I want to emphasize right now is that uh, keep in mind, everybody, that this is a physical reality in eternity. 
uh, you get out of this idea that uh, in eternity we're going to exist simply as some spirit being in a non-physical dimension. Uh, that's a big um, heresy, uh, and we're going to actually be living on the earth. It's recreated. It's perfect, and we're going to have physical reality around us, and we're going to have physical bodies forever. So uh, now what about these physical bodies? Uh, how different will they be, Brother Eric? Well, the, these physical bodies are going to be um, you know, un, untouched by sin. These are going to be bodies that will have a lot of capabilities that we are not familiar with. The big thing, I think, is what Scripture tells us is that we will be like Christ as we saw him. Our bodies are going to be a lot like what Christ's uh, resurrected body was like. Uh, it, it was the, one of the reasons for him kind of showing us that. Um, we know that his body was, he was able to appear in a closed room, uh, be from one place to another in a thought. Um, uh, these are only a few of the things that, that his body was capable of. Um, so, you know, we're going to be unbound by the limitations that we know now, that the things that corrupt our body in sin. Not only that, but our minds are going to be unbound by the limits that, that sin have limited us with. So, um, we don't know uh, what our full capability will be. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, so we're not only going to have a physical body like we have now, but it's going to be a perfect body that will never age or, or get sick, and uh, it'll be it'll last forever. I'll be out later, honey. Listen, I can't hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can't hear you guys at all. Okay. So I guess I I'll go. Um, Listen. God bless you, and Just thank listen. you. Listen to the rest of it. Okay. I can't hear you at all. Oh, okay. All right, brother. Watch it on YouTube then. <laughs> uh, so, sorry that didn't happen. That was a shame. That is a shame. Ron's a great guy. He adds a lot. He really does. Uh, so uh, anybody who's watching this now, you probably have been under the misconception that that in heaven we are going to exist just as, as a non-physical spirit and it's going to be boring and, and, uh, and you're not very excited about it. But we are going to uh, be living on earth, but it will be a recreated perfect earth and uh, we're going to have our bodies back, but they'll be perfect. Now these bodies will be super. They will be uh, better than they were before. Uh, with uh, We speculate some additional powers. Uh, and uh, uh, but it's going to be a physical reality. Can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. Right. To get off and I right. can't get done. Smart move, Ronnie. Very smart. You are you are it's quite the, the tech quit whiz. Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an electronic moron. <laughs> I <have no laughs> chance at it. So. so, Ronnie, what we're trying to emphasize to the viewers now is that uh, there is a big fallacy among uh, most Christianity. The people go to heaven and they're going to spend forever in a non-physical dimension as spirit beings. No, and, no, and Jesus proved that. Different. And there's actually a lot of people that probably say, "I'm not that excited about heaven because it seems like it's going to be boring, just like a you know one continuous church service." And, and I, I'm not looking forward to it. So we want them to know that that no, it's going to be a physical reality on earth, but a perfect world with perfect bodies. And it's going to be exciting. We're going to always learn. We're going to be ex doing exciting things, and and just it'll be just a joyful, wonderful experience. There will be no boredom in eternity. Right. Well, think, think like uh, scientists say we only use ten percent of our minds now, of our brain. Uh, we're going to have it all there. Mm -hmm. I think we're all going to be a lot smarter, a lot more intelligent. But uh, I think we're here to find the Lord you know, while we're still here. But Jesus proved physically, coming out of the tomb, that he's a physical reality. Yes. And that physical reality is in heaven right now. Right? Amen. So that's right. That should teach us something. And that, that's something I kept coming back to. When Jesus came back, and we're told in Scripture we are going to be like the risen Christ, that we'll be like him, right. um, and he was physical. He made a point of telling the apostles, you can handle me. I'm not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bone, as you see I have. Right. Um, th that shows us it is a physical reality. And um, I think that that 
creates a whole another exciting dimension to heaven to know that we're going to experience physicality in heaven and then on through eternity. It's um, Of course we're going to be physical. I mean, if we're going to come back into – think about this. As saints, if we're going to come back – we talked about the millennium tonight. If we're going to come back into the millennium and be kings and priests and help with the nations in, the, in, in a physical earth that is ruled by Christ in a physical millennium – why would we not be physical to do that too? So um, we're going to be physical for that role, and then when heaven and earth are combined, that's going to be a physical a physical uh, realm. That's going to be uh, except it's going to be a perfect physical realm, something we've never known even to that point. But we're also so, going to be much more because look at Jesus walked right. I mean, came in a, a locked room, you know. Right? See, great, see, great minds think alike. When Ron oh, couldn't, when, you know, when, when Ron, Ron couldn't hear me before, but that's exactly what I said, and he said the really? same exact oh. thing. So, so see, we're right on the same page. It's 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 yeah, exciting. Uh, same it's exciting Holy Spirit. Thing. Same Absolutely. Holy Spirit. Okay, Absolutely. so uh, you know that the vast majority of Christians have no idea about what we're talking about. They're they're under the wrong impression, and what Randy Alcorn coined the term. Christoplatonism, and he says this is the, the reason for all the misunderstanding about heaven. Uh, what, Eric, why don't you explain the term Christoplatonism and why it's such a problem? Uh, Christoplatonism is a, a term he uses a lot in the book. I think I think people may be more familiar with the term um, Gnosticism and the Gnostics that were um, that were around in the early church age, even starting brewing up trouble even in that time. And basically, what it is is it's the belief that anything physical is bad. Anything spiritual is good. Therefore, you cannot get anything physical in eternity or in heaven because all things that are are physical are bad. And that's the essence, the the simplest description I can give you. Yes. So that would leave the person with the, the conclusion that uh, we cannot have bodies. We can't live in a physical realm because right. it's, uh, the physical world is all evil. And so there will be no physical reality. But that came, Randy says, uh, from uh, uh, Platonism, uh, Plato, and Greek philosophy. Uh, right. They taught that the physical realm is evil, and, uh, and Gnosticism also believes the same thing. Uh, and that's why they well, didn't. How much do it. was the Nicolaitans involved in that? Do you guys know? Yeah. The, um, yeah, I, I know because even before Plato, um, I, the, the Gnostic ideals were way back in the early church. They, they were already fighting with these ideals and principles happening then, yeah. long before Plato. Uh, <laughs> so, Jesus said, didn't Jesus say he hated them? Yes. The Nicolaitans. Right. Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Uh, I believe the Nicolaitans are, are really uh, a, an order of people that started a hierarchy in, in the uh, – uh, clergy. And they were Gnostics? What, well, I'm not sure about the Gnostic part of it, but uh, it's, it's a, it, in other words, we're all equal. You're my brother. I, I'm not, I do not hold any office above you. You do not have to answer to me. We have Christ, and then we have the brethren. Right. But the Nicolaitans, they established an elaborate uh, hierarchy of, of uh, government within oh, their like organization. The and, yeah. Oh, the okay. Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans would be like the origin of the, the Roman Catholicism. Right? Oh, okay. Where they, wanted to, they wanted to lord it over the common believer and have, a, have a, uh, some kind of government over the, over the, over the, uh, the laity. Well, that's I don't believe it's just the Roman Catholic Church anymore. I think it's a lot of churches that want to take power over the people. You know, oh, sure. You know. So the, uh, the this idea of Christoplatonism or Gnosticism has had a horrible influence on uh, Christians' uh, understanding of heaven and what to expect in eternity. And I'm hoping that this uh, study we've done here has gone a long way to correct that problem. Uh, so you will have a physical reality existing, you will have a physical body, and uh, with a physical body, uh, we will have a physical, um, uh, uh, who has the speaker on? Uh, Someone muted if you give me some feedback. Uh, is that, uh, let me, I'm afraid for you to mute it because you might not be able to unmute it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that, that was it. So when you're ready to talk, uh, brother, just unmute your, your, uh, your speaker. Uh, you can still hear me, though, Brian, Ron, Ronnie. Shake your head if you can hear me. Okay. Uh, now that we established that we're going to have a physical body that never gets sick or old or dies and, and, and has some kind of uh, greater powers and abilities intellectually and physically, uh, 
What about food? Will we eat food? What about marriage? Will we, will we be have marriage? What about uh, in relations in a, in a marriage? Will we have those things? We've discussed those in the past, over the last few episodes. Uh, Eric, what, what do you say about that? Well, uh, in regard to food and things of physical nature uh, for enjoyment, um, uh, we are told specifically parts in Scripture that there will be consumption of food. Well, when Jesus returned um, and appeared to uh, several people after his death, he ate food with them. Uh, so we know his body, which is going to be like ours, was capable of eating food. Jesus told the disciples uh, at the Last Supper he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he drank it with them in his father's house. Um, so clearly there's going to be some kind of consumption of food probably purely for the enjoyment of the consumption of food um, as, as a part of our fellowship, as a part of our uh, being together. Um, we studied, uh, as far as marriage, I think the Bible is clear about that. I know people will argue the point and things of that nature. Um, we will have relationships as far as we will know each other for who we were to each other. Those, those relationships make us unique and they make us close. And as I said in one of the shows we did prior to this, um, I don't think there's any coincidence in the relationships we have. I don't think there's any coincidence that I have a relationship with you. That we now have, I now have a relationship with Ron, my friends, my family. I don't think that's coincidental. I think it's for a reason. God has us together for a purpose. That purpose is going to be made more clear when we go into eternity. Um, and we're going to cherish those relationships. And we're going to be able to, the whole purpose of going to eternity is to share relationships with each other in such a way that we weren't able to share those relationships on earth. Now, as far as marriage is concerned, as far as the marriage relationship, Jesus answers that question because it's put to him. Uh, he says that, no, we'll, we'll live like the angels in heaven um, in that we won't be, quote-unquote, bound to each other through marriage any longer. We'll be individuals in that the angels aren't married to each other. There, there aren't, there's a cohabitation with angels, at least in the good angels, the angels that stay true to God. Um, so those angels, um, we're going to be much like them. So while we will know and have relationships with those we knew, um, they won't be quite the same. But and yet we'll still be able to enjoy relationships as the people we are with the people we know for the sake of those relationships and who we are as people and and how we knew each other. Yes. Okay. Let me ask Brother Ronnie uh, to comment now based upon what Eric just said because Eric summed up the last couple of us studies that we've done on this about eating food, about uh, the uh, uh, the relationship with your spouse in heaven. And, and what about sexuality, too? Brother Ronnie, you want to talk about that? Well, I don't know if they're going to have a need for sexuality. I, but I do, really, truly do believe that uh, there's going to be a love in us that we never had before. We're going to have that full love of God in us and towards others. I think instead of marriage to, to our spouses now or whatever, I think it's going to be better. I think that love relationship is going to just outweigh anything sexual in it. Because we're not going to procreate in heaven, and uh, we'll be like the angels, like the brother said, but not like the fallen ones who came and cohabitated with women earlier. Uh, well, that's all, all I can really think of uh, saying. About. Okay. All right. So we, uh, you know, we may not be right about everything we're speculating here, but I think we're in agreement. We're in agreement that uh, my wife and I will still be. Uh, we won't have a marriage in heaven, but I'm sure I'll want to spend a lot of time with my wife and, and probably maybe she'll even live in my mansion or maybe we'll have a mansion next door to each other. I mean, I don't want to forget about her now that we're in eternity, you know. But on the other hand, we're not going to have a marriage relationship. There certainly won't be any, any sexual intercourse going on because there will be no need for that. There's not, not going to be any procreation. Uh, and, and we some people we know are very disappointed by that. Uh, but I think that what comforts me is that uh, we're going to be so excited about everything else that maybe uh, the idea for sexual relations may be like, who cares about that? I, I, so, this is so much better. I don't even have any, any interest in that anyway. Because if, if a person was going to be frustrated saying, I, I want to have sex in heaven, uh, then uh, they, they wouldn't be happy. They'd be crying. And the scripture says there will be no more crying or tears, so obviously they will not have that sexual frustration. Okay? Yeah, I think I don't, think don't forget the physical reality. You know, sexual yeah. sexual relations is a physical thing. You know, getting physical things out. You know, if I want to put, I'm just going to leave it there. But 
as a physical reality. I don't think we'll need that. I think I think our whole place will be like ecstasy. Yeah. You know? We'll be in the yeah. presence of God, our Father. So, yeah, so the question is, okay, if we do not have any central relations between male and female, then is there any reason for us to be anatomically correct? Will we all become male? Will we all be female? Will we become androgynous? Or will, will we still be uh, who we are? Uh, I'm a male. Will I continue to be fully male? No, well, I said we'll be like Jesus. So yeah. I think that I, I think that um, I think we're all going to re remain unique as we are unique in our lives. I think um, women will be unique, and men, they're beautiful in their own way. Men are beautiful in their own way. I think for that reason, we're all going to stay unique in that way in heaven. Just like um, no two dogs are the same. No two, you know, or else are all dogs going to look alike? Are all fish going to look alike? Are all, you know, I mean, no. I mean, it's it's variety. It makes them unique. Um, no, I I think that um, there's there's beauty in the female form, there's beauty in the male form, and I think those unique things are what God designed, and I think that's going to be preserved in heaven. Okay. All right, I think that pretty much gets us uh, kind of caught up. Uh, we've, we didn't, uh, obviously, in about, uh, you know, 45 minutes trying to summarize uh, 49 hours, uh, we skipped a lot. <laughs> but I think <laughs> we did a, it did a pretty good overview of it. Uh, so now let's finish every episode the, the way that we always do. Uh, we're hoping that uh, if you've been watching this episode and the previous episodes, that now you are excited about going to heaven. And you can say, hey, it's not going to be some boring thing, uh, you know, like just an eternal church service or something that would bore you to death. This is something to be desired, to the greatest uh, joy, uh, and, and you want to have a, a part of this. You want to have eternal life in heaven with the saints and with our Savior Jesus. So the question is, if now you're interested in going to heaven, what do you have to do? What do you have to do so that you can go to heaven? Let me ask Brother Ronnie to answer that question first for the audience. Well, for me, that's a very easy question. This is to what we have to do is what Jesus already done. He suffered on that cross for our sins. He rose from the dead for our justification. All God asks us to do is to believe on Him. That's all we need to do, just to believe on Him alone and what He did. Because we can't do it. That's why Jesus had to come. God who came in the flesh for us. He came to die on the cross for us. And all we need to do is ask Him, you know, be my Lord and Savior, please, you know, just take my sins and, and He will. Just ask Him and He will. Um, Believe on him who died for you, who shed his blood to wash it away. There's no more covering of sin. There's a washing away of sin by Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to do anything. He has already done it. We just got to believe in what he did. And then that's all I can say about it. I mean, that's the gospel. Jesus Christ himself died on that cross for us, and he knew he'd have to come and do that. He knew he, when he went through the suffering in the garden, that mental anguish, knowing that he'd have to take on the sins of the world. He knew that, you know. Uh, he suffered agony, but he did it for us because God loves us. Mm -hmm. And you think of all that love that Jesus had for us, that he took those nails for us. He went between the, in the earth and the sky, I mean the earth and the heaven, uh, to pay that price for our sins. And, and the Father, you got to think of the Father too, how much he loved us to give up his son for us. And all God says is, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you know. There's nothing more to that, you know. If you truly believe, and that's the hard thing to do, to believe that only he did it, only he can do it for us, without adding any of ourselves to that. Um, I believe that's what God wants us to do, and I believe that's what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and it's by grace, he had God's grace that we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. People, I, I beg you, you know, I'm not going to be here much longer. I've been given two to six months more before I go home to be with my Lord. Um, I have no fear of that, but I'd like to take as many with me as I possibly can. All i got to say is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. I, I beg you. I really, really do. We'll see. He promises that. Amen, brother. Well said. Uh, let me ask Brother Eric to see if he wants to... Uh, uh, 
uh, add anything to that, and there nothing needs to be added. But anything further you want to say about about uh, uh, what Ronnie said? Well, I'm, it's kind of hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> Brother Ronnie really uh, he laid it all out there. I mean, it, it, it's you know, um, I take I take great joy in the fact that I don't have to be weighed to found uh, measured to see how well I measure up to get into heaven. Um, I'm glad that God doesn't measure me based on that and that he doesn't make it based on my merit because I know I fall very, very short of what he expects. Um, God, a perfect God, demands perfection. This is how you enter heaven. And Christ tells us in the scripture, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And this is his whole point for coming. It is in trusting in what he did, not trusting in ourselves. We have to we have to take away that desire to be control freaks that we are as human beings. Yes. Something we never something we never had control of to begin with. We we but we never had control of this. We came into this world tainted with something that was beyond our control. And if we don't ask the Lord to take this from us, if we don't trust yeah, in him for it, we're gonna leave this world with that same uh, taint upon us. We can't. We can't add to it by thinking that anything we do to this takes away from or adds to this. We can't maintain it. We have to trust completely with Jesus to maintain this because we are incapable of adding or taking away from any of this. And the greatest part of this whole thing is, is once you do, what Brother Ron said, once you say you you. And this is what repentance really is, folks. People, you're going to hear a lot about repentance. Repentance is simply changing your mind. Repentance Amen. is repentance is seeing yourself for what you really are. It is accepting what God says about you. I am sinful. I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. And there's only one person that can do that for me, and that's Jesus. It's not me. It's not the church. It's not somebody. It's not praying to saints. It's not anything like that. The work Jesus did is all that needs to be done. And it's like it's like when you play poker, you know. You, I'm all in on Jesus. All my money's on him. All my yeah. all my chips are on him. Okay, because yeah. um, because God tells us, you know, when we do this, when we believe in this, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Yes. He puts yes. His seal on us. That seal cannot be broken. We become children of God, and no father ever discards his children. You cannot lose your salvation. This is not something that can be taken away from you because it's not something you maintain and it's not something anybody else gave to you. It's something freely given by God, a free gift that is simply there for the taking by you simply saying, I trust you, Lord. I put my faith in you. I trust what you did was sufficient. That's it. It's very easy. It's not. People want to complicate it. They want to make it a complicated issue, and it's not. It's one of Satan's great victories. Because everywhere you go where these people want you to doubt your salvation based on your merit, they always lead to the same thing in all these places. They'll tell you if you don't if you're not doing things that add up, then you should question your salvation. That's a that's a victory by Satan. He wants you to doubt your salvation. He wants you to doubt what Christ did for you. Because if you doubt what he did, you become an ineffective Christian. You can't you're you are no longer effective. And Satan has won the battle there. So you, you you can't be effective if if effective if you don't trust what Christ has done, or if you don't if you don't, or if you believe constantly you're taking away and you're and, and you're you have to earn it and re earn it and get it back. That's something that Satan wants you to constantly be battling with, so you're distracted with that and that you doubt. He wants you to doubt. Don't doubt. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, you know, you believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's all you need. It doesn't matter what anybody else tells you. That's all you need. Then trust in him, and he will change your heart. It's like it's like Brother Ronnie said. People are going to tell you that we're telling you that's that gives you a license to sin. No, it doesn't. And we would never tell you it's okay to sin. It's absolutely not okay to sin. God doesn't want you to sin. But when when you ask, when you trust Christ, and He comes into you through the Holy Spirit, you begin to see a change. The law becomes part of something in your heart that you want to obey, not out of fear. Of, of God squashing you, but out of desire to please your Father. You, you want to be pleasing to your Father, and that's what it's all about. It's not about saving yourself. It's about, it's about keeping a good relationship between our Father 
and his children. That's what it's all about. So don't doubt. Stop doubting. Trust in your salvation. And most importantly, trust in Jesus for that salvation. All right. That was beautiful. Uh, I could listen to you guys, uh, you saints, uh, talk about salvation all night long and love, never never get bored with it. Uh, the, only, the only thing that I want to add is that uh, uh, I, I've spent uh, many, many years asking people a basic question, and that is, do you think that you're going to go to heaven? And most people tell me, well, I don't know. I hope so. And then, or they, maybe they'll say yes. And I, my question is, well, why? Why do you think you're going to heaven? And almost every person tells me, I, well, I, I hope I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person, because I do this or I do that. They're, they think that they can go to heaven because of their own personal performance. If they perform well enough in this life, God will be happy with them and let them into heaven. But what I want everyone to understand is that's man's way, and it, and it fails. No one gets to go to heaven because of their personal performance, because of personal merit. That's not God's way. Because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. You can join all the religions of the world. You can become the most religious person in the world, and you still are going to be lost. And you won't go to heaven unless you do it God's way. And God's way is to put your faith in Jesus and not in yourself. As Brother Eric said, you go all in. You bet everything on Jesus. You don't bet 50% on Jesus and 50% on yourself. You say, you say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. You, put, you bet completely on Jesus. You believe in him. You depend on him. And you say, I am not worthy. Nothing I've ever done gives me any merit. Instead, I'm relying on my Savior, Jesus. That's the, what we want you to do. That's repentance. That's changing your mind from believing in yourself and now believe in Jesus instead. Uh, if you do that, let us know. We want to celebrate. Thank you for watching. And uh, brothers, thank you for joining me uh, on this uh, study on heaven. And I'm looking forward to the next study uh, the uh, next topic is ready with an answer. Uh, we'll begin that next week, and we're going to be just taking on questions from the audience and answering your all your theological questions. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.